Welcome to the Start of Grind. <laughs> Let's give a big Start of Grind welcome for Selma Shaw. Here we go. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, well, we, we like to just start these off a little bit by just getting to know you uh, a little bit. Tell us about sure. where you grew up. Uh, tell us about, um, you know, your background a little bit and, and um, how you have kind of gotten to, to where you are today. Yeah, so I'll do it real quickly. Grew up on the East Coast, um, New York and sort of suburbs area. Spent, <clears throat> spent about a year of... Spent about by the time I was five, I spent a year in India, and I think my family was trying to move back and decide what they were going to do. And then I was raised in the U.S., went to college, and then when I started working, I just had odd job after odd job. I worked um, for the DA of Manhattan DA. Thought I was going to go to law school, decided not to do that. Then I was a professional cook for a year. This is out of undergrad, or yeah. Kay. And then I was a professional bartender in New York for a year, um, and then I moved Favorite to California. Drink? Yeah. Favorite drink is? Oh, favorite drink. I thought you said, can I drink? Um, <laughs> favorite drink right now is the Aviation, which is an old gin cocktail. Um, know it well. Yes. Um, and then I moved out to California, got into product management, got into economic development and finance, got really into that, thought I would go back to graduate school, move to India and work there, worked on a bunch of projects, decided I never wanted to live there and then rushed back to the Bay Area. So I moved back here to Palo Alto in the summer of 2010. Okay. And then I, before I moved here, I'd never worked at a technology company. I don't have a technical background. Um, I, don't, I never really held a real job, actually. And I, I don't think I worked at a real company ever. <laughs> Dang it, I don't think you were the person that I was from your LinkedIn profile. Is that somebody? No, that's you. I'm just yeah. kidding. It's a different semel we've been. Yeah. No, I mean, so you moved here in 2010, and, and what were you doing? Um, that was actually a pretty hard year because I had, I was in Boston for graduate school, and when we moved back, I had some clients that I was working with there, and they were nice enough to keep me going, and I was trying to get into startups here, um, and I found it actually really, really difficult. Um, and I was interested in two areas, so that was actually a pretty rough time. And, and there were like two sides of the coin because I met a lot of really smart and dynamic people, and most of them said no to everything I proposed, right? In a really nice way, um, but yeah. And this is in terms of, of, of like ways that you could help them, or, or are you talking about products or companies that you were trying to start, or what do you mean? What, what, what were you getting turned down with? No, because when I was in Boston, I was lucky enough to be part of a team that started a life science company, and I don't have a life science background, but I had had some company formation experience with some very well-known people in, in the Boston science community. Yeah. But I knew when I came here, I didn't want to do that, and it wasn't, I wasn't built for that. Um, so I thought I would either work at a company or invest at a company. Um, I'm sorry, invest in companies. And other people didn't think that was a good idea. Um, yeah. Let's, uh, you know, I, I said this in the introduction, but, yeah. um, you know, you have such, uh, you know, there's, there's some very really talented, smart people in the Valley. And I like to say that the, uh, Naval is is probably the smartest guy that I that I have met in the valley because his data set is so incredible. Like mm -hmm. I mean, he's he's smart for a number of different reasons, but he he has so much data. And I feel like you have. Uh, and one reason we really want to have you is because it feels like you are a part of so many conversations and mm -hmm. things that are going on that are that are so relevant and interesting. And the conversation I think our audience can really benefit from. I wonder if we could start by talking about um, what you're seeing with with founders, entrepreneurs that are starting companies right now, yeah. you know, what it, what, you know the, the psychology of starting a company, the psychology of an, an entrepreneur, t tell us a little bit about that. Sure. And so just as a disclaimer too, like I use Twitter all the time. If I say something interesting, throw it up with the hashtag and I'll sort of write back to you later. It's an easy way for me to like keep tabs on that kind of stuff. And I, I love meeting new people through the medium. So if that's something that you guys do, um, I live on that site. 
And so what, yeah. what is your and what is your Twitter handle? Oh, it's just my first name is Samil. Okay. Yeah. So I think that so if you look at the situation right now in the let's say the U.S. or Western economies, um, there's a mass. If you look at like a thirty thousand foot level, there's a massive restructuring going on in the labor economy, um, and that the bottom third of the workforce, there's a lot of jobs that aren't coming back. Um, and there's, it, this is kind of a nationwide problem. Um, corporations are holding on to money, and they're using the time to like not, not invest or, or sort of restructure people's salaries. So you have that trend. You have people coming up who, from an attitudinal point of view, don't ever want to work at a large company. And so they don't see the you know, benefit of, of joining a company versus just striking out on their own. And then if you think about the trends, like you look at Pew Report trends around millennials and the generations coming up, they're doing all these crazy things. They're, they're sort of staying in, they're staying in school later. They don't want to work at a big company. They're going back to live with their parents. They're getting married later. They're, you know, they, they don't think that they'll ever retire or the retirement age will be really late. So you have this massive, massive shift happening and it's on, at, at the same time, in parallel in technology, you have all the growth happening in the valley here. You look at the public equities and tech, right? Look at Yelp. I think I invested in Yelp as a public investor about eight months ago, and it's up 180%. Wow. Right? That's an amazing amount of growth for a, basically a vertical search app on your phone. Um, so there's just a lot of intensity, a lot of interest in people starting companies. There's limited downside. It's really easy to create software. There's a lot of tools and libraries you can build on. The problem is, is that it creates a really harsh choke point. And that can be really hard. And it's, um, it can be hard for people who are just starting the first time or going on their 10th time. Um, that's sort of my macro view of, of what's happening. And that's it's very concentrated. It's happening in different cities, which is awesome, because those different cities need that kind of reinvention. And it's happening in a very concentrated way here, which, you know, cr there's a lot of flowers blooming, but only so many will get so high. When you talk about choke points, what are you talking about? Um, funding choke points, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's, there's more and more capital coming in, but there's only so much time and so much money and attention that can be applied to the products that are being built. What, how have you seen, um, talk a little bit about the last couple of years and then up to today in terms of how the funding climate, at least in the Bay Area, uh, has changed from what you've seen? How has it evolved? Yeah, so I would say in, in no particular order, um, just the continual secular shift towards mobile, um, both on the consumer and enterprise side. That's just huge and not stopping. It's like a huge... It, it's a huge wave. Um, I think the the fact that angel investors are sort of hard to find now, um, even though AngelList, and we can talk about that later, is kind of changing it. They're becoming more professionalized and looking for more proof points or pieces of information. Um, let's see what else. I think you go through the shift back and forth between people saying, consumer or selling a business or consumer selling a business, the reality is, is that both of those businesses are always going to be fundable and there's always going to be people who are interested in it. It's just a matter of fact that if you look at the outcomes, the consumer focus outcomes are always bigger in terms of enterprise value, so they'll always command higher valuations and more interest. It's just tougher to spot. So you see, there's more funding, uh, there are more investors. Are they just putting more money into the into the same products are they are they well i mean from from an investing point of view if you're managing a fund the 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 best place to make your money is in a follow on investment so if you've invested in a company at series a and you've let's say you've made five investments over two years as the first institutional money in but one hits your fund strategy is to pile the rest of your money into the winner right so you kind of create a funnel so that, that happens often when it's because of fund economics. Let's talk about, you know, if I'm an entrepreneur yep. and I'm looking to raise money, talk about some of those things that, as you see, entrepreneurs that are successful at that, 
what are some of the characteristics that they have? What, what are some of the pieces of their puzzle do they have put together? And then, um, you know, tell, tell us a little bit about it. You must see some commonality amongst these people. Yeah, I think that um, this, this doesn't apply as a general rule, but as like a directional signal that, and I learned this from actually watching both reporters and investors, the best reporters and the best investors don't like to be pitched. Um, they actually have an idea of what they find interesting, and then they go out and hunt it. So as an entrepreneur, if you're building something and you want to attract the best people for what you're building, whether that's an employee, potential recruit, or a potential investor, or a potential partner, the real goal, you know, high bar, should be creating something so unique and differentiated that the person who should find you finds you. The problem is that there's a lot of people in this area, right, in this geography, who are doing great things, who may have trouble finding the right person either because they don't have the network or they're too busy finding, um, they're too busy working on their product. So there are some inefficiencies there, but generally, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of hard to say this, but at the end of the day, the market is sort of efficient for funding, and that can be a harsh reality for, especially people building or seeking out uh, financing to sort of grok. Are you talking about the very top cream of the crop companies? Because we hear these stories about people that, you know, beat down doors up and down Sand Hill. They won't give up. They pitch, you know, 100 investors. Yeah. You know, and, and, it, and at some point, some of these people do find success. Yes. Are, are you defining just one subset of everyone, or what, what is your take? No, on? I mean, that, that definitely happens. I remember there's, like, a very, I think, 20-year investor at NEA, Scott Sandell, who was on a panel once and said that his best investment in his whole career when he... When he made it at the time, he obviously didn't know. And then once he, he made the investment, I can't remember the company, they said, actually, hey, Scott, you were like the 40th firm we pitched to on Sandal Road. Hmm. So, you know, who, who knows how, where that stuff comes from. I do think in this environment where, you're, where there's a lot of entrepreneurship and the barrier to starting something is so low and all those other sort of um, macro factors that I said earlier, it does make it harder. You can, you know, I sometimes meet founders who, you know, you, you sort of wonder and you turn into like a professional fundraiser, right? That's sort of all, all you're doing. Right. And then you sort of have to stop and ask, okay, well, what am I spending my time on? Right. Yeah. And, and so does this, so how many people in here have ever had an investor approach them about their product? Lee Blaylock, of course. A couple, a couple of people in the room. Yeah. So, I mean, my experience is yeah. that you know we got an article on TechCrunch about some product we launched and like and I expected, I thought man the, the investors are just gonna, I don't know if they'll pour in but they'll so come. There's a couple things going on there. So one is an investor may think, if it's already made it on TechCrunch, it's yeah, too late. I've missed it. Right. The other way is that they use filters. So they'll say, well the universe is so big, Silicon Valley is so noisy right now. I've worked here for ten years and I have a network different networks of people that I've built up relationships with, and if something filters through my network like a Brita filter, I'll get it, right? And so they'll be, they'll be okay with missing something. Um, some people have wider networks and sort of looser filters than others, and some people have really tight filters where they'll almost try to put you through a maze. And if you get through the maze, they'll sort of say, okay, this person got through the maze, right? And there's sort of a game there. And then the other way is around sort of cold cold emailing someone, and I've seen a lot of investors do this, if someone sends them a short, personalized, thoughtful, brief, relevant email with all the information they can act on, they usually respond. The problem is, is that most people send sort of forwarded emails, unformatted emails, emails with big attachments, emails without context. So actually language and communication becomes really important. Um, Maybe especially in this environment, if there's a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of different people who can fund them, and it's hard to connect those people, yeah. the language actually helps. And the and we, but can you define brief for us? What does that mean in your mind? I can sort of get it. I can sort of understand the gist of it and the signals you're sending by looking at it on my phone. Two, three sentences, five sentences. That no, can be a little bit more. Yeah, be a little bit more. 
It, it's interesting because some in, some investors, uh, Vinod Kosal has said that he reads every email. He he shouts out his email at every event, yeah. and uh, including the one he did with us. And he took a cold email from me and then came and spoke at our event. Um, and then there are other people uh, who say there is. I've never invested in a cold email. I've never invested in in. And they have these other filters, and they they kind of stick to those. Yeah, I think the thing about investing is that different different modes work for different people, and it's a personal thing that people sort of take. I mean, um, you know, some people broadcast and market themselves a lot, and they sort of want to create this magnet that will attract certain people, and there are cer certain people who don't want to be seen, who maybe invest in one or two companies a year and work with them, and they're comfortable with that. So it's really personal. So if, I, if I'm building a company, yep. and... Uh, we're heads down, we're building the product, but these things don't come at me. Investors don't come at me. I'm getting traction. I'm getting these other things. Mm -hmm. Does that, it, it kind of feels like it's like this chicken and egg where if I'm really cool and my product's really hot and my market's really hot, then I'm going to get all this attention and things, things are going to kind of materialize. If, if I don't fit into that, um, you know, then, then what do I do is can I, can I force it or, or, or do I just have to kind of hit the right sweet spot? And well, I would almost like, ask a series of rhetorical questions in that scenario, right? So what's the nature of that enterprise if people are actually using it? Do they want to be a lifestyle business? Do they want to get venture funding? Why do they want to get venture funding, right? Then you have to ask, well, if, I, if my product is actually moving, I need to be efficient about who I'm targeting for funding. So that means I need to do some homework to figure out what my product is, where it fits, and who could be interested in it, right? So actually, the work done up front to get that formula right actually saves a lot of time on the back end, right? And then you have to convince somebody else that, you know, the venture-style investment is two or three or four years of either no growth or no revenue, but there's some point in the curve where that tips, right? Otherwise, why would you take venture money? So talk about how do, how do I... Tell us about how do I find the right investors. So I can, I read about all these investors. Oh, I want George Zachary to invest in me. I want Mike Abbott to invest in me. But how do I actually find the right guys or, or uh, males or females to, that, that, are, that are interested in what I'm doing? Because it feels like by the time they post on their website, by the time they write about it on Twitter, it's too late. They've made investments in those areas. Yeah, I would say the the first thing is to be honest about what the product is and in what space it is, and if the institutional investor can actually use it. If it can't be used yet, it's probably pointless to reach out. Then I would probably, if I'm being tactical about it, I would say, okay, my product is loosely in category X, and I define it this way, and I would be broad, and then I would try to do, do my homework and see, well, can I come up with 20 people who have invested in similar products or around the edges of what I'm doing. And then I send them a short personal email to maybe hop on the phone and tell them about what I'm doing and signal to them that I'm being conscious of their time and also my time. And I have a specific thing I want to talk about. right? And then you go through that step. And likely, if you do things right, you'll end up meeting the right people. That doesn't mean they'll necessarily invest in what you're doing. But that's a way to sort of short circuit it. You you kind of just briefly mentioned this. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about this idea of if I'm pre product, uh, what what stage should you know like are there kind of are, are there some things where it's just a complete you know don't bother if you're this like if you haven't gotten to a working great so product. A, a couple of things that I think, and this is partially why I want people to tweet because I don't think this gets said enough, but it. It does bear repeating. So one, this sort of goes back to your previous question. Social media influences a lot of this stuff. And investors are out there branding their money. And there's nothing wrong with that. And a lot of these people are super smart and successful. But they can create brands that people get attracted to. And then the entrepreneur sort of forgets, well, why would I be attracted to this person? right? And so that signal gets totally lost and it creates extra noise. Hmm. So I just want to make sure that I sort of communicate that. Um, can you repeat the, the last question? Yeah, well, 
what things like you said, uh, for instance, I'm a great product guy. I have this great track record. Oh, pre-product. Okay, I can yeah. come in pre-product. Or... So the, the, the key sort of framework here that people sort of often lose sight of is that all investors are not created equal in terms of assets under management. So if you're talking to someone who's an institutional fund and they have $100 million under management, Four hundred under management, five hundred million under management. They're going to have a. They're going to look at you with a really different set of glasses than somebody who's seed investing, angel investing. So first, understanding what the economic incentives are for the person who has the money and who's deploying it often gets lost. Typically, for people who are pre-product, there actually are some firms and individuals who, and this is rare, but they do exist, and they have actually been really successful who will invest in people just as people before they even start anything. But the majority of people have to have something going, have to show that they've jumped through some hoops um, in order to get, I would say, let's call it more professional valley money, right? And that can be anything from brand, you know, a branded seed person all the way up to the general, you know, men and women who run funds at, you know, institutional level. And so what, what are some of the things? So I, I've got to have, so I've invest my own money. I get to a working real product. I've built, a, I've started to, to build a team or I have a team. But do I have to have user traction? Do you, do I? So what do, it what just do depends saying? what stage. And so I'll, I'll lay out a formula that I think could work. But, you know, people can fork it in their own way. It's, um, it's not by any means religion. But if, if people are just starting out, um, here, here, here are some types of things that send good signals. Um, I went out and started on my own, and or I started with a team, and we have people using this already. We poured in either some of our own money or some of our own debt into the company. We raised money from people we know. They call this friends and family, but I'll be more specific. People that you have worked with or worked for, if they can even you can even get them to invest like ten thousand dollars in what you're doing sends a very strong signal. So if, you, if people piece together those things, it, in, a, in an introduction or a cold email, the investor may say, OK, like there's, there might be a chance that there's more authenticity behind what this individual is doing. That's really, that's really interesting. Um, and, and, and so it's, it's putting together the story elements. It's, and, and so a piece of that is, how, where have you gotten? What traction have you achieved? Or, or you know, with the money that you started to use, what have you been able to build? And what else? Talk about the team. Like, so, um, uh, you know, some people invest solely on who the team is, who these people are. What signals do I need to send as part of the team in, in order to get through some of these gates? So I, I can't answer that directly because I don't have a lot of experience, but I can sort of stitch together what I've seen other experienced investors do. And so what's important to understand at this level is people who are making institu you know, institutional level bets on early stage companies, the greatest risk sort of all forms around the foundation, the founding team, and who's going to be the CEO. So for example, a lot of the reason the people, investors say that they want the founder to remain CEO is that most CEO searches just fail. Now today, with Twitter going public, is actually kind of an amazing story that Dick Costolo was able to like stitch all that together and get them out in the market. Yeah. But generally, investors do not want that headache. So if you if you keep drilling down on that, like uh, Paul Graham has been pretty public about trying to figure out what the chemistry is amongst the founding team. How long have they known each other? Have they already sort of figured out? what the fair equity splits are going to be so that there are no problems later. There's a lot of co-founder risk. Um, I actually experienced this myself, like the hard way. Um, and I'm sure anyone who started a company uh, has gone through that, and so you know what it is. And so investors pick up on that very quickly, um, especially when somebody is leading a deal um, at an institutional level, because that could be a five to 10 year commitment. and if one of the co-founders has to leave, it takes up a lot of the investor's time. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about mobile versus web. Um, sure. You, you write a lot about this. You talk a lot about this. Give us some of your perspective 
on on this kind of wave as you talked about earlier that's yeah. happening with mobile and what you're seeing with companies uh, who are kind of taking advantage of that. Yeah, mobile's exciting to me. I've been working on iOS primarily for the last two years, both on the investing side and product side. And I would say it's um, such a huge secular trend that I can actually go to places and talk about it credibly, having no technology background. It it really is very disruptive in a lot of ways. I know some really great web developers who are trying to learn Objective-C or trying to learn to develop on Android. They're having a really hard time. I know a lot of investors who are trying to invest in mobile who have never touched a mobile product. They, they don't understand how to evaluate those investments. And the business models, I believe, over the next three or four years will really threaten actually quite a number of startups because once you start transacting inside the app and the platform start opening it up, you'll see a lot of innovation in business, business model innovation. Why should I be paying for a subscription for X when I just use it five times this month and once next month? And you'll see the micropayments and the scale that's coming in mobile like re really um, create a lot of waves. So it's a super exciting platform. Um, I'm frankly just personally lucky that I got opportunities to work on it because I had no background in it before. And so I just view it as school, like I'm in school for mobile. Yeah. You know, you talk about it being very hard to develop, to be a great, great mobile developer. Are you seeing trends of where these people are coming from? Are they being trained in, at certain companies? Um, or do they have certain characteristics? I mean, there's a lot of people in this room that probably are trying to hire. How yeah. many people are working on a mobile product? Okay, half the room. Wait, so. hire. I didn't see all that. Hire. Okay. Okay. What's everybody else working on? Go ahead. Shout it out. What platforms are you working on? Okay. Good crowd. Really. <laughs> it's the start of grind crowd. Hey. Um, so, web? Who's working on web, not mobile? See it. Okay. Everybody else is black. Yeah, I mean, one thing we can talk about is just sort of the pros and cons of doing, you know, doing the first steps on web with an eye to mobile versus yeah, doing please. mobile first. So there's two companies I worked with in the past um, that very purposefully started on the web, understanding they would go to mobile. And the arguments they made, great teams on both sides, um, that they could figure out what the product was going to be, iterate faster, deploy their technology, um, get market feedback quicker, uh, get people on the platform more because it's open. Uh, and when they felt like they were at a point to get ready to develop for mobile, they had a better idea of what they wanted to do. Um, now, that was about a year and a half ago. I think now the downside may be it's hard to have a venture-style conversation if you're not mobile first because people are looking for outliers on mobile. Um, the problem is, is that it's really hard to develop for. So the, this is just very anecdotal, so I wouldn't extrapolate from this, but I found that the best engineers I've worked with don't care what platform or what language they're developing on, they just figure it out. And there's very few of those people. The other people who are able to code and develop for iOS, they're either usually younger coming up, so maybe they've been exposed to this in school or taking classes online or this is the first time they're even really interacting with the internet in a mobile age. Or there's somebody who's, who's been fortunate enough to work at a mobile company in sort of the first wave of the iPhone, and they were able to port that knowledge over. Mm -hmm. And then you have people who are able to pull networks of people outside of Apple and Google who, can, who have been developing for iPhone for a while. In terms of what is... Uh, um, you know, what is the kind of the expectation today? I, I wonder if you could talk to, um, you know, what, what types of download numbers or user numbers or engagement uh, that you see that these great products or great apps have? Um, or or what, are, what are metrics that you think are meaningful uh, for people that are saying, hey, I built this product, I've got users. Um, what types of things are, are um, yeah. outside of your kind of typical you know, metrics, what, what types of things should people look for to see if they're, if they're really getting product market in, fit or in not? A, in a mobile sense? In the mobile sense, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. Um, so one, one dimension of mobile engagement is, is around attention. So how, how often are people coming to the application, 
let's say on a, a ratio of a weekly to monthly basis or daily to weekly basis, all the ratios you read about. And then how long are they staying inside and how often are they coming back? So it's really um, about engagement. Once they're inside the application, how long are they there? What are they doing? And it's different for every app. Um, I was on a panel last week talking about it, so I'll sort of parrot what we sort of came up with. But there's these sort of global aggregate numbers that everyone sort of looks at, which are what are your DAUs, what are the weeklies, what are the MAUs, and then what are the ratios between them. The problem is, is that for every specific product, the critical number that you would measure is very, very different. So I can, I can just give you an example at Swell. So Swell is like, think of Pandora for talk radio in the car. We designed it so that if you're commuting, you don't want to download podcasts, you just want to hit play and go, and we sort of learn your interests over time. So what's important to us is we want to hook people. There's two things, right? We want to figure out, okay, once you're inside the application, how much time are you spending in there? And luckily, we found that people are sort of engaging around 25 minutes up to hours at a time because they're in the car. So we're able to unlock that time. Um, we're competing with a lot of different types of services and things people do in the car, but you know that's how we think about it. The other thing we think about is re-engagement. So if we've got you inside the application, how can we remember to have you launch it again? And so this becomes part tactical and part psychological. The tactics are we we test push notifications and try to time those and personalize those so that they hit you at the right time. So for example, can our algorithms figure out when you commute, if you leave your house at 820, we send you a push at 819, right? That's like the holy grail. Are we there yet? No. The other way, which I think is getting really kind of gnarly right now because email is such a great channel, is that everyone is doing email re-engagement for mobile, which when you think about it on paper is kind of just dumb. But there's no other way to do it unless you're going to pay a dollar per install or dollar per re-engagement hook on Facebook. So anyway, though, that's how I sort of think about the metrics. Now, if you're, there's a different set of company, which I would call in like the Uber category, where you're basically um, using the phone to aggregate demand for something. I want a Postmates. I want an Uber. I want a Lyft. I want someone to come over to my apartment and clean it. And then you're, you're, you're fulfilling the demand offline. And so what you're basically doing is grabbing the credit card, routing the service, charging a fee, percentage fee based on that. And so you need a certain type of repetition or recurring revenue that you can model out so that people can, can see that it's excited. Now, I have to be a downer here and say that despite all the interest in mobile, distribution um, and discovery of apps uh, there's two ways of looking at it, but ultimately it's so hard that um, even sometimes great products, and this is the really sad part, can sort of, you know, it's like a tree falling in the forest and no one's there. Um, and so, you you know, it, it can be, it's going to be a very harsh environment for a few years. And what, what, are, what are companies that you're seeing, what are, they doing to, what are they doing to address it? What can you do? So obviously a great or differentiated product um, negates everything I'm going to say next, right? Um, but if you look at generally broadly the distribution of apps that do well, meaning get a lot of users and or make a lot of money, they fall into very clear categories. So I would say three out of every four successful mobile app is in the gaming category. So if you're an entrepreneur trying to be really precise about where you're trying to strike and you say, okay, I'm going to go after games, well, you're inviting a whole other set of problems because you have to create the next Angry Birds, the next Supercell, the next Candy Crush, right? And if you create that one, then people expect you to create the next one. And we all know what happened there. Um, that being said... Angry Birds Star Wars? Angry Birds Star Wars. Um, Great game. I think that company is valued at like $10 billion. Really? Yes. Invested in by Excel? Invested by Excel. Um, the caveat here is that the, especially on iOS, the convergence, the, the advancements in the chips and what the networking, local area networking that can be done, actually offers some really interesting opportunities around games. So for example, if I ever met an entrepreneur that was doing something 
using underlying multi-peer networking to do a game where there's no cell signal or no data signal where all of us could play, I would definitely talk to that person. Um, but the chances of me meeting that person are close to zero. Now, if you take out games and you want to do something in mobile, there's very clear categories. <clears throat> Number one is they're leveraging a sensor on the phone, most likely the camera. So you have the Instagrams, you have the Snapchats, the obvious ones. The second cat or, or location, although location's a little bit early because of battery life. The second category is that they're hooking around a network effect. So you have mobile messaging. Mobile messaging companies are probably going to get to the enterprise value globally, um, each one of what Facebook is. It's that big. And they're already turning into platforms. And then you have, um, going back, the third area is where you aggregate the demand and then fulfill the service offline. So if you're, if you're a mobile entrepreneur and you're not in one of those areas on the consumer side, you either have to create a new category or model, which I know somebody will do, or you have to sort of pick and say, okay, I'm going to go into this area because I think that increases my percentage likelihood three points. The interesting thing, just as a side note about Snapchat, is if you notice, Snapchat combines three of those four categories. A huge game mechanic around a photo with messaging for network effects without any reliance on Facebook graph or Twitter. Let's talk a little bit about, and we're going to take questions here in just a minute, so and I'll, I'll, we'll come pass the mic around. Talk to us a little bit about AngelList. Um, uh, what, is the, what is the general sentiment of people, uh, the people that you're speaking with, the investors, uh, about AngelList? What do people really think about it? Um, and then what is you know, your take on you know, what it's doing, what it's changing, and how yeah. entrepreneurs can address that? So I'm a huge fan. I think, like you, Naval is brilliant, um, true entrepreneur. Um, pretty amazing feat. I'm personally excited about it. I'm definitely going to leverage it in a certain way when I figure out exactly what the model is for me. Um, I say if I talk to larger investors, um, the kernel of their feedback is the larger investors love it because they want more and more people to start companies. They want more flowers to bloom, and they know that there's only going to be a certain amount that reach a certain height, and they can be there to invest in those companies, potentially. Um, I think some investors who are earlier stage investors wonder if it's the right thing, you know, sort of on the, on the other side of the argument, and say, you know, does, it, does an entrepreneur really benefit by having their money syndicated by people they may or may not know, um, and having less people around the table to help them? I think it just depends on the entrepreneur. You might find an entrepreneur who says, I just want money and this one person to help me. Or they may say, no, I want to know everyone who's investing in the company, and I want to create slogs for different people um, to have them come around. But generally, what I hear is that it's going to, be, it's going to create a lot, of, a lot more efficiency at the early end of the market, and that later stage investors like that because it, it creates a platform for more signal for them to make their moves. You, uh, you have a syndicate on Angelus. What, do you know what, it, what the number is up to today, as of today? It's no, I haven't really. 60 or 70. It's 000. under 100,000. I yeah. haven't really like, fully thought about it, but I, I have started investing this year, and I do want to use Angelus as a part of that. So I think at some point I'll get more aggressive about it, but I want to make yeah. sure that I know exactly what I'm doing um, before I do it. Yeah. Um, what questions we we'll take some questions from the audience uh, if you've got one raise your hand and I'll I'll come run the mic to you um, uh, yeah Lee go ahead yeah so I mean, what are I think, your thoughts around the equity crowdfunding market? Yeah, the, um, the fraud piece is interesting. I mean, part of the reason I think Angelus is so disruptive is that it will create opportunities and also create some unsavory situations as well. Um, one of them being that there's a higher likelihood that people involved in transactions, whether they're a backer as part of a syndicate or whether they're an entrepreneur allowing a syndicate to invest in their company um, might not fully understand the impl impl implications of all that and could say, hey, you've, 
I've been defrauded. So that's actually one thing, that's one reason I'm actually being patient about this since I have my own private fund, um, is that I want, I want to make sure that if I do the syndicate, everyone who ba decides to back isn't going to say, well, where's my money? Or I wanted to do profit sharing with the company and all these sort of other things that people don't immediately understand as retail investors. And, you know, it just takes one person to say, like, hey, you defrauded me. That company isn't going anywhere. Um, and that's not really something I want to deal with. But it's going to happen, right? It's going to happen. Um, as far as to answer your question around later stage, I don't see that happening anytime soon because generally when a company gets to that stage, unless the entrepreneur is, is one in a million, they definitely need an institutional partner. And so I, I don't see that getting to that point in the next three to five years. What I do anticipate is a firm like Andreessen Horowitz or like Union Square Ventures, for example, I believe like within the next year, they will try to lead the first institutional financing in a company and they'll syndicate part of that portion through AngelList. And there could be different reasons for why they do that, but the most compelling reason is that before they may have shared a piece of that deal with a network of people that they know. But in the future, they may say, well, we're investing in a company X that's in market Y. We don't know much about market Y, but we're going to use the internet vis-a-vis -vis AngelList to find the right people to connect us to. And it creates a much more efficient platform to doing that. Uh, this is a question from Twitter. Do you think, do you think Twitter will start to open up uh, their ecosystem Post IPO. Oh. Uh, wow, that's a good question. I I don't think so because I think they were in a period of you know. If Tweetbot and Tweetdeck didn't exist, I don't know how many of you use Twitter constantly or use third-party clients. They've pretty much locked it in into their own clients and their own web experience. Um, I think Tweetbot they they acquired Tweetdeck. And I think Tweetbot is like a couple of engineers in Texas um, who are independent. So I, I don't think that they'll open it up. I think they have to lock in to capture the value. Um, I think one of the hardest challenges for Twitter is that it's, it's such a big idea and it can get to such a high scale. It's really like a modern day telephone system that they've built. The problem is, is that the telephone turned into a utility that you monetize based on minutes used. And so what Twitter has to do is figure out a way to capture the economic value in the information that's shared before it becomes too dispersed to be invaluable. So for example, um, I bought a camera for my wife for her birthday, and I asked on Twitter, you know, what's the best camera to buy, and this is her needs. And then someone suggested the Sony camera, it was $6.99. I bought it within a minute, right? And so Twitter routed that for me. On, on Google, Google would have gotten paid through that transaction. Um, Twitter didn't get paid, right? So I think they need to answer those types of questions. The things they have going for them are that um, Facebook um, coming back has reopened the market. Twitter today was really good to the bankers, so Wall Street is going to be really... Ex Twitter did Silicon Valley a huge favor today. Seriously. Um, and then... You know, they've got to figure out how to grow into the valuation because now they're, you know, they're up there. But I, to answer the original question, I don't think they'll open it up. Unless they open up very strategically, that moves a revenue needle. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about relationships. You haven't really been here that long. Yep. Um, but yet it seems like you're so connected and you've had, you have conversations with, with some of the, the very top people. I wonder, like, what is your philosophy on on building relationships and in kind of your, you know, what, you know, what, I don't, I'm sure you don't have like a strategy. I'm sure it's just very natural what you do, but like, tell us about what, what you've done that you think has had an impact and, and maybe some ideas that entrepreneurs could, could em emulate. Well, I, I'll answer it, but I'll qualify it by saying, I think it's hard for an entrepreneur who's building to invest in that because there's a great Paul Graham essay about a maker's and manager's schedule. And like the, the maker schedule is like you don't want a lot of stuff on there. You don't want to be meeting a lot of people. You don't want to be maintaining a lot of relationships. And there's like a tax to that. 
and the, the non-maker schedule is like you're meeting people and trying to figure out who can help who. And the great thing about living here, as you all know, is like you can, uh, you know, sounds cliche, but you can meet with anyone. Most people are generally helpful. So I just sort of found that, you know, can I, can I meet people? Can I connect with them? Can I ask how I can help? Can I actually follow up? Um, and then I think, you know, over time you sort of, you meet some people who take advantage of you. That's fine. Normal course of life. You meet some people who will go above and beyond and help you that are just kind of crazy. Um, and you, you never expect it. And so you just have to sort of take each interaction with how it goes. I mean, I don't, in, in terms of re relationships, I've been lucky to be able to consult, um, be a paid consultant with a lot of different venture capital firms. And so they're very social by nature, and I've been able to like access a lot of networks that way. So um, yeah, but it's not something I would generally say, hey, go and go network. I don't, I don't think that's a productive you know, path. Um, but I do think keeping in touch with people is kind of a lost art. Asking them how they're doing is kind of a lost art. Mm -hmm. Actually following up on what you discuss doesn't happen that often. So those little things do add up. Stands out. I think so. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what do you see? What do you see, you know, over the next uh, 12 to 18 months? What, what are you excited about other than some of the things we've talked about tonight? What, uh, what are you interested in? What, what do you see coming? Yeah, so um, I think the the Bay Area in particular is in like inning two or three of just a massive, massive change. If you think about the potential either IPOs or um, you know nine figure acquisitions that are in the pipeline, especially for companies that are based in San Francisco proper. It's pretty insane. So I think what you'll end up having happen is that you'll, you'll have a lot of companies form. There's a lot of early stage capital. That'll sort of wane. People will leave the area. There'll be an exodus of people in every cycle that leave. And then people will join the next winners because part of the ticket of being able to live in a place like this is that you, either, you have to have equity in some sort of... Yeah. Uh, defining company or company that has an outsized return. So actually right now there's a huge opportunity for either smaller companies to be acquired or just to join up and join like a larger company. So I think that will happen as a macro trend. Um, areas I'm personally investing, if I was being selfish, marketplaces, I've made three marketplace investments. I'm trying to hunt down number four and I'm writing about it this week. Uh, I've made three core infrastructure investments. Um, there's just an insane amount of talent around here, people building new types of um, infrastructure models, whether they're doing cloud infrastructure, enterprise infrastructure. And then, you know, I'm trying to leverage my knowledge, my small knowledge base in mobile and always testing out new apps and trying to meet new people who are, who are doing this. So I'm always excited about those three things. Um, the, those are the two things that I'm sort of thinking about over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, uh, one more question for you, and we'll wrap up. And, and that's about that's about TechCrunch. You've been yeah. kind of the most consistent uh, con non TechCrunch employee, probably to write on TechCrunch over the last yes. couple of years. I think it's like a hundred. No, it's 70. I did 70 weekly continuous one-on-one -on -one interviews. Wow. And then I I think maybe like a hundred columns. Wow. Yeah. And, and I mean, that, that's a tremendous amount of work. And it's a tremendous amount of, of effort to put into something. It's not a paid position. Right? I, mean, I mean, you don't, I assume it's not a paid position. For a while, but, they were generous in helping, doing like a small stipend around the video. Okay. Yeah. So, like, uh, tell me, tell us about, like, what is the value in that for you and your position? Like, what, it's something you spend spend some time on. It's something that you've been consistent about for a long time. Yeah. Um, what What do you get out of something like that? And and yeah. what what's in it? What What do you get? Yeah, out Yeah, I of would it? say like, obviously it's, you know, TechCrunch isn't perfect, but it's really a great platform, and it's amazing people there. And if Mike and MG and Eric at the time didn't didn't create that space for me, I probably wouldn't have survived here, hmm. like straight up. 
I probably would have moved somewhere else. Because the opportunities that came from the writing or the vision that you got from, from being involved with these people? Or what, what do you mean by that? No, it's just that um, it's, it can be pretty tough to move here if you're not very specific in a certain area. And um, I was given a platform to share my ideas with people. Yeah. And then luckily that was able to resonate with a few other people. And I got to meet people around sort of shared interest. I also use Quora a lot for yeah. that. Um, but if I didn't have those two platforms, you know, I think it would have been really, really hard. It was already hard. It would have been extra hard for me to do it. So that's why I keep doing it every week, even though, like, I have very limited time, is because if I didn't, um, if I didn't do that, I would be, you know, I don't think I'm super relevant today, but I would be even less relevant tomorrow. So it's kind of like the cost of admission. And I view it as, like, I work... You know, I work on product, I work in investing, and I try to blend those two every week and just basically share what I'm seeing and hope that it, you know, if I can meet one new person a week through that medium, then it, it pays off. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's give Samil a big, huge round of applause for coming tonight. Thank you very much.